Hello again. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about the concept of team diversity. So when we think about team composition, one aspect of team composition is just thinking about the characteristics of teams. In the previous lecture, I talked about um, qualities of team members, including demographics, age, education, and personality and knowledge, skills, and abilities, both task-related expertise and team skills, and personality and values. And I shared with you some research um, about kind of general levels of those uh, and what happens when teams have higher or lower levels, for example, of openness to experience. In addition to just the kind of raw characteristics, Teams are configurations of people, and so there's variation in the people. And so there could be variation, for example, in expertise. If we have a multifunctional team, a pr new product development team with people who are from brand, from marketing, from finance, maybe from sales or customer perspective, supply chain, engineering, that would be a very diverse team based on the skills and expertise of the team. But we can also have diversity based on other characteristics. And so there's a variety of things we can think about when we, when we try to talk about diversity in teams. Um, and the three different kinds of ways to think about this are the amount overall, like is it high or low diversity? Is a team very homogeneous and similar? Or is it very different? And that could be on one dimension like expertise or function, or it could be on many different dimensions. We can also think about this idea of type of diversity, which I'm going to talk a little bit about in a moment. And we can talk about the idea of configuration of diversity. And a, a very important concept for us to understand is the idea of a fault line. And I'll come back to that. But one thing is the type of diversity. One way to think about the type of diversity is actually the content. And that's what we've already talked about a bit in the previous composition lecture. But the sources of diversity can be these surface level demographics like gender, or age, or race, or nationality. And then they can be these deep level qualities that are not as easily observable or it takes time for those to show up in interaction like personalities or values, some capabilities or expertise. And next week when we talk about processes and psychological states, we're going to talk about the idea that for teams to understand things like who has what specific expertise is a very important thing for them to develop and teams that develop a better understanding of the knowledge stocks and information and experience shared in the team outperform those that don't develop that kind of understanding. So you can imagine that when a team first forms, if there's diversity on things like expertise, the team can't leverage it as much because they don't know it as well. So these deeper level qualities can be a source of diversity, they can be a source of challenge, even before people recognize or understand that that diversity is present. But over here, there's a really important uh, figure that has, has kind of developed relatively recently in the literature. You know, it's 2007, so it sometimes takes 10 years for things to get into a textbook, for example. Um, and what this says is that, you know, there's the type of diversity and there's the amount of diversity. So we can have low, moderate, or high levels of diversity in a team. But what type means here is not the not really the surface level or the content that's here, but there's actually different ways we can think about how team members are diverse. And the most common way is to think about variety. With variety meaning are people the same or different on one kind of dimension of diversity? So in this case, low diversity for variety would be everybody's the same. So people are all the same age or people have the same function. This is a homogeneous team. Maybe these are all HR personnel. This one has moderate because you see there's circles, squares, triangles, pentagons, I guess. Um, and those might represent, again, a functional diverse team. So we might have salespeople, we might have brand people, we might have engineers over here. Um, this one's moderate because there's, there's, there's uh, four different kinds, but there's eight different people here. This team, with respect to variety, uh, is extremely diverse because everybody's different. So this might be a cross-functional team with a person representing every 
different function in the organization. This could be a committee in the Carlson School where every single person is from a different department. Um, so that's maximum diversity on variety. That's what people often talk about or think about when they think about diversity. But there's another one, which is separation. And separation is if there's two extremes, maybe this is um, people from different countries, for example. So everybody here is the same. They're in the middle of this, or maybe it's a value. Maybe this is collectivism. They're kind of all in the middle. Here, this team is moderate because the team actually has people all across the spectrum of um, collectivism, let's say. Here it's maximum because there's these two poles sitting here and we have extreme subgroups. And what we know is in this case where there's these strong, strong subgroups in a team, this has very serious performance problems. Um, in other situations, this sort of maximum variety doesn't have the same problem because there are not strong subgroups here. These teams may have some difficulty understanding themselves, understanding perspectives, because there's so many different perspectives, but they don't end up with kind of an us versus them mentality that these kind of separation sorts of diversity have. And then finally, disparity. This one you might think about as power in a team. So this one has low because everyone's about moderate power. This one is actually moderate because we have actually people all the way across the spectrum in the team. This one maybe would be extreme because there's one person with extreme power or maybe extreme wealth, right? And there's so many people down here at the bottom. This is the highest level of disparity. This may be natural if we have people with high authority, one leader-led team and everyone else has lower authority. May not pose a problem in that situation. May pose a problem if this represented some kind of access to resources and only one person really had that access. So alongside the classical ways to think about diversity, we need to think about the way it's actually configured or shaped or distributed in the team. And that has implications in terms of the outcomes for diversity. These, the entirety of this slide, I think, represent why the research on team diversity is very mixed. There is some research that shows that diversity is beneficial, and there's a lot of research that shows that it's problematic. And part of that, at least, is because unless you are very concrete about what the source of the diversity is, is it demographic or is it expertise, what the relevance of that diversity is to the team's task, or even what kind of diversity or type of distribution of that diversity there is in the team, it's hard to predict why, why and when that would actually be beneficial. But we do know that this really high separation is usually problematic. We know that kind of moderate levels of uh, variety can be problematic because it can create subgrouping. And we know that high levels of disparity, especially if it's related to power, um, or resource access can also be very problematic for team. You know, what does research say about diversity? Again, I just mentioned it's really mixed. Um, and a lot of that has to do with what the research question is and what kind of diversity is and what's being measured. But one example is a meta-analysis, again, of 24 studies. I shared this with you looking at team size in a previous lecture. Um, and what this shows us is that when diversity is job relevant, so this is another thing to think about, if the diversity is something that's needed for the task, it can have a positive effect. So in this case, the outcome considered was team innovation. So if people had diversity on the knowledge required for the problem that was an innovation or creative problem, performance was supported. Um, in this case, just sort of straight up background or demographic diversity created more problems for the team. So this shows one other way that people have thought about diversity. If it's task relevant, if the diversity is actually something needed for the work, it tends to have a more positive effect. However, it still can create process problems. So next week we'll talk about that some more, that it can still elevate things like conflict in teams. So unless teams are good at managing those processes that are challenged by diversity, even if it should help, like job-related diversity, it can still cause a problem. 
And the other things we know from research are that if there is a high value in diversity, so if leaders can cultivate an understanding that diversity can be beneficial and that people actually value the differences present in the team, that can make diversity have a stronger positive impact on performance. And same can the idea of re reflexivity where people actually engage in a process of talking about how they like to work, what they know, what their backgrounds are, and trying to understand those points of connectivity. In a previous lecture where I talked about values and person team congruence or fit, that again shows that if leaders can establish the positive purpose, shared goals, and common commonalities that we all do have, that can also help enhance the benefits of team diversity. So if you have a very diverse team in, as a leader, you need to find those positive identifications that people have with the team's purpose and find the points of similarity that people hold with one another. And that can help you leverage the benefits of team diversity. So in addition to the idea of levels of diversity, there's also um, a concept or idea of configuration of diversity. Um, and in particular, this is the concept of fault lines that uh, Lau and Murningham introduced in 1998. And what they basically wanted to show was um, you could have teams that have high levels of diversity, but they don't have this thing called a fault line. Or you could have teams that on the surface look like they're pretty similar, but they actually have very strong fault lines. So, um, you know, a team that has a lot of diversity can have very weak fault lines. So what happens here is that there's a lot of diversity. There's um, three, four different kinds uh, or races or ethnicities in this team. Um, we have a, a highly, you know, mix of male, female, 50%. So this is high separation on gender. Um, we have wide variety in age, high, high variety in age. And then we have extreme variety in the um, actual positions present in the team. So from one standpoint, you might say, wow, this team might be in trouble because it has really high diversity. But it actually has very weak fault lines, which means that there's no lining up of diversity. So we have, we have uh, an Asian male who's older, and we have a black female who's also older, okay? Um, and we have white female and white male who are younger here, but they are crossing with unskilled, uh, excuse me, machinist and executives here. So there's, they're kind of bridging the, what would normally be maybe a difference in any of these are being bridged one way or the other across. There's sort of a crisscrossing happening. However, team two, let's look at, if you looked at the just overall diversity, um, there's two races here, not four. Uh, the gender disparity or difference is the same, two and two. Um, but the age difference, if you looked at average age, it's, it's going to be um, higher than this team. And we just have two different kinds of, of positions or functions here. So this team has lower diversity than team three, but it has a very strong fault line here. So uh, fault lines were a concept like a metaphor borrowed from tectonic plates that sort of separate continental um, pieces. And what we see here is there's a really strong fault line here because this group lines up with race, gender, age, and function. This is a very strong subgroup. And over here, race, gender, age, and function lined up. And what we know from research is that fault lines can create a lot of problems. When teams have these very strong subgroups aligned on multiple dimensions, not just one quality of diversity, these uh, affect performance to a much greater degree than, than diversity on any given dimension. And frankly, even um, can harm teams that otherwise are, have low diversity overall. So something to be very aware of is to watch for fault lines um, and engage in activities to bridge them and make sure that these strong subgroups groups do not um, develop in your teams. So the some of the research on functioning uh, and how fault lines affect functioning is if you look at these independently, like just demographic fault lines, the previous slide 
showed fault lines that were based on multiple types of diversity or sources of diversity. But if we just looked at single kinds, if there were fault lines based on demographics, so age, gender, and race, those are extremely negative. They have a very strong negative effect on cohesion and a very strong positive effect on conflict. But these deeper level sources of diversity, if those fault lines are present, they're not quite as visible to team members. And it's not as easy for people to kind of blame the diversity when it's not as obvious. So one thing to watch out especially for are strong demographic visible fault lines and take efforts to try to um, mitigate those. And that might even be meaning pairing up people if you have subgroup tasks or subcommittee tasks in the team, bridging across those groups to try to make sure that you blur and blend those fault lines. So overall, um, diversity has this double-edged sword, but demographic diversity also has this challenge. They're, they're, it can represent different inputs, different perspectives, different life experiences, different customer resources or sources and experience in a team. So there can be these positives, but when demographic diversity is aligned into fault lines and subgroup clusters in teams, it can be extremely harmful and detrimental to teams. Um, so another thing I mentioned earlier in this lecture is this idea of pro-diversity beliefs. So if leaders can show why diversity is beneficial and can act to bridge those fault lines, um, to make sure that there are kind of structures in place. We'll talk more about structures in later lectures for tomorrow's class. But communication, making sure that there's even communication happening and that people are participating in the team to cross the fault lines, they require this sort of intervention if they're present. And as I mentioned with fault lines, it seems like the overt demographics that are more visible seem to have a bigger impact in teams than the deeper level diversity. Um, but another way to think about how diversity might affect teams is what we might characterize as objective diversity versus perceived diversity. So objective diversity is, you know, maybe you actually know the age, the training, the background, the function, the experience in the organization, the title of people. Those are objective sources of diversity. But other research, um, in particular some of my own work, also argues that diversity only matters if people perceive it. And so you could, at, in fact, have a fair amount of on-paper diversity, and a team that doesn't perceive itself as very diverse, because it might people might focus on the sources of similarity that they have, for example. So I've already shared that, that that's part of what a leader can do is to get people to know each other, get people to have and identify common bonds, get people to identify with the team as a source of commonality and common purpose to override some of the perceptions of objective diversity in the team. And this is a very complicated diagram from a research study I published a little over a decade ago. But basically, um, a couple things to take away from this research are that um, what we saw was that this is sort of objective diversity on this side here. So we, we measured the actual diversity present in a team. So things like what kind of um, undergraduate major did you, have, did you have, what work experience do you have, and these kind of overt demographic differences. And what we predicted is that when a team first is formed, uh, these overt demographic qualities will be what affects people's perception. People will even, and frankly, even of the deeper stuff, because they don't know this. You don't know the knowledge that people have. So people might immediately look at the team and say, oh, wow, we're really different in age. Uh, I expect we're going to have very different values and very different work approaches. So this is what we predicted and we found, is that if you took a team that had a lot of demographic diversity and then you asked them, how similar are you on these qualities? How, how similar are you demographically? Not surprisingly, they said not very similar if there was a lot of diversity in those overt demographics. But interestingly, they also said and expected that they'd be diverse on things like their values, on their work styles, on their problem solving approaches, on their expectations, even on their personalities, without any information. So people take that first snapshot 
of what they see in objective diversity, and they make these judgments about each other. And what we found was that the actual sort of deep level diversity was what drove things like conflict um, as maybe a negative process and information as a positive process in the teams. And that as people had a chance to work together, if they experienced a lot of conflict, they actually said, you know what, I think I'm less similar than I thought. If they experienced a lot of positive information sharing and learned from each other, they said, I'm actually more similar than I thought. And if, in fact, there was low perceived similarity as the team worked together, we saw a lot more subgroup formation based on those fault lines happening in teams. So the takeaway here is it's not just what's actually present in the team, it's how people are thinking about it. And so leaders need to understand that if there's conflict happening, for example, it's your job to try to get people to recognize the benefits of the conflict for the work and deflect the idea that conflict is representation of bad difference in the team. Also use good processes to get people to share and support because that will increase the sense of similarity in the team. And as you do that, you can diminish the effect or the activation of those fault lines. So again, lots to think about here, but lots of places that leaders can intervene by increasing pro-diversity beliefs and showing people the benefit of difference, by mitigating the negative aspects of conflict and trying to show people the value in having conflict and that it's not just because we're different, getting teams to share information and back each other up, and getting teams to engage in reflexivity to understand that there is diversity and that the value of that diversity or the usefulness of that diversity to the task um, and show people that can also elevate the benefits of diversity for the team.